So uh, I'm Roy Galitz, and uh, today I'm going to talk to you about our world. I'm going to show you four of my favorite places in the world. We're going to go through many places, but those four places are the ones that I cherish the most. And the reason is that in those places, I can see our environment changing the fastest. So I've been in many places around the world, and everywhere it's beautiful, everywhere is pristine. There's not such thing as a boring place. We already established that before we started the stream. But there are some places which, in my opinion, are better than others, more interesting than others, more fascinating, more intriguing, more unique. And I'm going to start off with my favorite place in the world, and that is Svalbard. Has anyone been to Svalbard? Ah, you have. I'm going in May. You're going in May. You also? You should. Join her. <laughs> <laughs> so Svalbard is amazing. I'm going there every year at least three times a year. OK? I'm, I'm fascinated. I'm in love. I'm obsessed okay, with Svalbard. I went there for the first time in 2012. And that's the first time I, I discovered this place. So Svalbard, in a nutshell, it's an area of 61,000 square kilometers, okay? which is about three times the size of New Jersey. Okay? So it's pretty big. But the population is only 2,000 people, most of which live in the capital, which is called Longibien. Longibien. Okay, so uh, there are uh, four other settlements over there. There is Nialesund, which is the northernmost settlement in the world. 35 people live there. I met the mayor, he's a really nice guy, really humble. Uh, there is another two Russian settlements. One is called Barentsburg, and one is called Pyramiden. And there is another Norwegian miners' settlement, which is called Sveagrova, which is the Swedish mine. So, Longibin is the capital. It's at 79 degrees north. The main income is coming from mines, tourism, and research. The climate is cold, but mild. So it's not that cold. Okay, so this week it was around uh, plus 10 degrees Fahrenheit, which is not that bad, considering the latitude that it's at. So the reason why it's not that cold is because it's uh, being affected by the end of the Gulf Stream. So the Gulf Stream, if you don't know, is carrying heat and salt water from the equator across from the Caribbean all the way to, nor to Western Northern Europe and all the way to Svalbard. And there it sinks. So that's keeping the climate relatively mild. Some other cool facts about Svalbard. So it was discovered in 1596 by Willem Barents, the Dutch. Okay, the, the sun doesn't rise between uh, October 18th and February 20th. So within just less than a month, the sun is coming back and everyone there is pretty excited about it. Okay, imagine living four months with no sun. You can sit here if you want. I saved your spot. No? Are you okay? Okay. So, um, and the sun doesn't set between April 18th and August 20th. That's four months of daytime. So everything about Svalbard is unique. Nothing is the way you thought it will be. Okay? And how do they deal with the dark period, as they call it? They have sun lamps, which emit the same wavelength as our sun to fool our circadian cycle in the, in the brain, our biological clock, so we know when it's daytime and nighttime. And in the summertime, they use heavy drapes. Okay? And they simulate the night inside their home. So you can, they can decide when it's daytime and nighttime. So Svalbard is a, uh, it, was, it was declared as Norwegian territory according to the Svalbard Treaty, which is signed in 1921. And since then, it's Norwegian ruling. So this is how I look like in Svalbard, OK? <laughs> and I'm not usually wearing this kind of suit. This is, I really prefer this suit much better. Um, so condition in Svalbard is pretty <coughs> tough in the springtime. Pretty nice in the summer, but pretty tough in the winter and spring. So at the beginning when I started going there, I looked like this. This was the first time I went to Svalbard in the springtime. This is 2015. But 
I'm looking like I'm having fun, but I'm not. I'm actually pretty cold. Okay, I can't feel my hands, I can't feel my toes, I have frostbite on my nose, I'm asking myself, what am I doing here? I miss my home, I miss my kids, I miss liquid water. Um, so, and then I found out, I learned that there is no such thing as cold. There is not properly dressed. So then I started going there, I'm looking like this. Okay, so that's a selfie, it's a good thing that I'm smiling. <laughs> but I can assure you that I'm not cold. Even when I took this selfie, I wasn't cold. Okay, because I'm really well dressed. So I'm very well insulated, I'm keeping myself warm, and I'm actually I'm having the, the best time of my life. I'm, I'm laughing. You, 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 can, you can see it, but you can't hear it also because of the wind. Uh, but I'm laughing because it, it was so funny. So over there I'm driving on the snowmobile. Okay, this is a snowmobile uh, which carries me across the frozen fjords, over glaciers, uh, and getting closer and closer to the animals and the wildlife. When I was there in 2015, I flew a drone. And while flying the drone, everything looked even more awesome. I mean, the entire surrounding looked like something out of Game of Thrones. You know Game of Thrones? So this is like the North Wall. So everything is, is like magic in this space, like Narnia, if you know Narnia. Okay, everything is, it's a, it's a white desert. It's a desert, classified as a desert. The land is permafrost, meaning that it's always frozen. Um, so this is an ice cave in a glacier, uh, which in the summertime gets the molten water, melted water out of the glacier. But in the winter time, of course, it's frozen. Uh, the thing I liked about it, that it looks like a shark's mouth. Okay, but I give you also a tip, a safety tip. Okay, so you see those icicles coming down? They are dangerous. Yeah. Okay, so you don't ever, ever stand beneath one of those. I'm actually not standing either. So I'm about a meter inside the cave and not under the icicles. Okay, just to keep safe. Because that thing can skew you like no time, okay? Especially if you open your mouth. So I'm traveling there and I reach the abandoned Russian town of Pyramiden. This town was abandoned in 1998. At its peak, there were over a thousand, even a thousand five hundred people living there. Okay, it's part of the Russian mining town of Pyramiden, owned by Arctic Kogol, which is a Russian uh, conglomerate. So it was abandoned in 1998. But according to the Svalba Treaty, every place that is abandoned for over 10 years goes back to Norwegian sovereignty. Okay, so the Russians sent six people to live there. So it's not abandoned anymore. So it's pretty, it's pretty lonely living in this place, uh, as you can imagine. So I was there in 2015 and I met a really awesome guy. He's the only one in town who speaks English. His name is Sasha. So this is Sasha. He looks like he just came from the Soviet Union. Yeah. Okay, it looks like the hunters from Peter and the Wolf, if you know that. Uh... Yeah. So this is Sasha. He's really Soviet. I was there on May 1st. Do you know what's May 1st? Workers, workers Day, yeah. yeah. It's a Workers Day. So the, in the Soviet Union, they do a parade. So Sasha did a parade. <laughs> So he's walking around town singing Russian Soviet songs about that the communism is the best and capitalism will never work. That's the song <laughs> the song is about. I didn't have the heart to tell him otherwise. So yeah, maybe he still thinks the Soviet Union is still alive. So but we're not there for for the town, we're not there for this post-apocalyptic uh, uh, environment. We are here for polar bears. And finding polar bears is really tough because polar bears are white and the landscape is white. So we are searching for polar bears and we're going from one fjord to the next, scanning by binoculars, and it's really tough. But when we do find it, we get the gear ready, we get everything out. This is a workshop that I'm guiding. So this is me and the three people I'm guiding in the workshop. Uh, so we're getting all the gear ready. We're preparing ourselves to photograph and this is 
the first polar bear that we saw. So this is a mother and cub, and they're walking across the landscape. But they don't want us to photograph them. We call those kinds of bears don't want to be photographed, we call them butt bears. Okay? Because they get away from you, and the only thing you can see in photograph is their butt. Okay, so that's a butt bear. And of course, we don't chase them. Because first, we don't want to harass the animals. Second, we don't really like photos of polar bear butts. Okay? So we just let, leave them be. So we continue searching, we continue scanning, and then we found this most amazing polar bear, a mother and two cubs. And they are so cute, and they are walking towards me. And I'm fascinated, I'm clicking like crazy, I'm also videographing as you can see. Uh, and this mother is walking, and then you can see she smells a seal's breathing hole. So the seals have a network of breathing holes, and they must come up and breathe every 8 to 30 minutes, otherwise they will drown, because they are mammals, they're not fish. So they have to, to, to breathe. So she's waiting near that breathing hole for the seal to come up and then she can hunt, hunt him and feed her young cubs. So the cubs are nearby, they're playing, they're fighting. You can see how much the mother loves her cub and how much the cub loves its mother. And you can see that the cub is probably embarrassed about something. The cubs like to play around, they like to kiss and, and bite each other and then suddenly mama bear is leaning back and she does this motion with her chest the little cubs just start running towards her climb on top of her and start breastfeeding so this is such a heartwarming moment to see the mother breastfeeding her young cubs so these cubs were born in december in the dark period inside a den and when they are born they are about the size of a squirrel, but they are blind and bold. Mother bear takes the two to four cubs, picks them up, gets her to, a, to her chest, and covers them with, the, with her fur. And then they breastfeed. So at the beginning, her milk is 40% fat. It's like molten ice cream. And then as they grow up, the fat content reduces in the milk, and then goes to 35 and 30% accordingly okay but the cubs need to grow up so when they come out of the den at late March early April they have enough fat and body mass and of course fur to survive in this environment the most important the best compliment that I can get out of an animal is if that animal falls asleep in front of me unlike public speaking okay by the way but if the animal falls asleep, in, if it falls asleep in front of me, it means that it trusts me, she trusts me, with her eyes wide shut. Because you don't go to sleep when you're stressed. Okay? So at that point, I knew that this bear trusts me completely. And I knew that I can work with this bear for the rest of my expedition. So, of course, they woke up. After they wake up, the cubs start running around, playing, and then mother bear and her cubs are walking towards me again. At some point, they were so close that I, I couldn't fit them inside the lens because it's a 600 millimeter lens. So I did the only logical thing, and that's shooting vertically. Okay? But they were so close. Suddenly, I felt a tap on my shoulder. I look around, and I see Tom, my local bear specialist, and he tells me, Roy, we need to leave now. I'm getting my eyes out of the viewfinder, and I see the bears are 15 meters away from me, 20 meters away from me. So at that point, of course, that's why I have Tom to guard me, because when I'm concentrating, I'm concentrating, and I got to have the best professionals to keep me safe. So we left the gear, we jumped on our snowmobiles and drove away, leaving all of the precious gear behind. OK? After that, we can come around pick up the gear and continue photographing. But nothing is worth endangering the animals. Okay, nothing is worth confronting the animals. The best form of, of confrontation is escape. Okay, because if we gotta shoot a flare gun or a bear spray or a gun, 
which is the absolute last resort, which we will never use, that's bad. That's why always avoidance is better than anything else. Okay, we gotta respect the animals. We are guests in their home. So, mother bear is breastfeeding the cubs, and of course she's got to eat. So this is food. Okay, that's a ring seal. So he's resting on the ice, sunbathing, enjoying the warm sun, minus 10 degrees. So uh, his breathing hole is right next to him. Okay, as you can see here, uh, where is the, here, yeah. This is his breathing hole. Okay, and behind him you see the polar bear. So, but he's not worried at all because the bear is far away, and if she starts going towards him, he will hear her, and of course, in the, within a second, he can jump into his breathing hole. So, mother bear is trying to hunt. The cubs keep ruining her hunt because they always move and jump around. Every sound above the ice is transmitted through the ice to the water, and then the seal hears it, and then he goes to the next breathing hole not to become dinner. So the mother bear is furious with the cubs. Okay, but you can't be furious about them, with them because they're so cute and adorable. And mother bear is continuing to hunt. She tries to hunt again and again. And you can see the cubs playing and mother bear is trying to punch through a meter of snow, three feet of snow, because there is a seal layer, seal den underneath the snow, just between the ice and the snow. And she can smell the seal within the den. She can smell through a meter, three feet of snow. So she tries to hunt and she fails again and again and again and again. And of course, it's frustrating because she's got to eat. So we spoke to Tom and I told Tom that I want to photograph the polar bear hunting a seal. But he said that the chances are zero percent okay so of course he knows what he's talking about because he's the professional and he I'm asking him why, why he's being so negative so he said well the only reason it is that it has never been done before okay and I'm like okay so two things first let's understand why did everybody fail because there must be a reason there must be a pattern and of course he's the one to know it Second, this is another reason to try it. So we sat on our knees, we went back, we went 70 meters away from the bears, which is 200 feet. We are on our knees, we can't move, we can't talk, we can't do anything except for stretch. Just stretch like this and stay low. We gotta be completely silent and completely ready to photograph when the action will happen. So we are waiting and we are waiting, we are waiting for hours and hours and hours and nothing happened. Okay, I'm thinking, okay, he knows what he's talking about. <laughs> but then at 6.49 a.m. I heard a splash. I started photographing without even knowing what's happening, to be honest. So I'm just clicking and then click, 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 and I see that the polar bear has caught something and she's pulling it out of the ice. And it's a seal. I can tell you I'm not cold, <laughs> I'm not tired anymore. Okay, she grabs him by the neck and breaks it. The entire thing is seven seconds from start to finish. Seven seconds, which is so easy to miss if you're not ready. Because you don't know when it's gonna happen. Imagine sitting for 10 hours and some, at some point there's gonna be seven seconds of action and the rest, nothing. Okay, so you gotta be ready. And it's easy to miss, and I was fortunate enough not to miss it. Uh, so this is actually the first time ever in history there is a polar bear, cat, a, photo, a photo of a polar bear catching a seal. So this expedition was really successful in those terms. So this image has been featured in many places, including natural history museums, magazines, awards, and so on and so on. Of course, after that, Dinner is served. <laughs> so they have a seal takeaway. Uh, the cub is really proud of its mother, just sticking his tongue out. And then the female cub is coming to say thanks to the mother for the dinner. Another time when I was in Svalbard, I saw this male walking across the fjord. 
and he's searching for something. He's smelling and tasting the air. Okay, what does that mean when he's tasting the air? There is a, an organ in the mouth, in the upper palate, called Jacobson's organ, and that's to detect pheromones. So there are pheromones of a nearby female. Okay, and he found her. So this is courtship. The male is walking after the female, is following the female, clicking, knocking his teeth, and then the female can hear it, and then she becomes in heat, ovulating. I think this is like a serenade or something, uh, and it really works. So the male is following the female, trying to convince her to mate with him. The female goes to sleep. The male is frustrated like a big puppy. Okay, and then finally they are ready and mating. Again, this is really, really rare to see mating on the ice because many of the times it happens in the mountains. And in the mountains, it's really hard to go with the snowmobiles. So that's also very rare. After the mating, the male needs to cool things down. <laughs> so he's doing this yoga thing. <laughs> and then he continues to walk along the fjord. I love this backlight in photography, by the way because it shows the animal contour, a fine line around it. So the male is going around the fjord, searching for something to eat. In 2000, that was 2018. In 2019, again I went, of course I'm going three times a year, and then I saw this. So, you see this male walking in the fjord? This male, has a broken canine and two bleeding wounds. He was just after a fight with another male. Okay, of course we couldn't get there because we don't want to disturb the fight in the middle. And this is the female they were fighting about, they were fighting for. So this is the, the winner. He comes to the female and he starts his courtship thing. And here you can see the female is walking with her behind away from the, from the male for obvious reasons and that's the female the male and now I'm gonna show you her cub so the female had two cubs and the male chased them away if they wouldn't run away he would have killed them okay so here the male is going for the female and then the female is signaling him, signaling him that she's ready okay and this is mating, in case you didn't understand yet. So that's mating. And then the male keeps holding to the on, on, holding on to the female. The female goes away. And this is like a kind of a little fight about why didn't her release her before before that. And then she's like, okay, with this I'm going. He's eating snow. Uh, that's the way they drink. In the snow. So the female is going, and then the male, of course, is following her. So they keep doing that for a week or so, continuing continuously mating, uh, just to increase the chances of fertilization. Okay, so they have, she has a successful pregnancy. So you can see that here they're walking, and you can't see their feet because of this. the wind is blowing the snow so hard on the frozen floor. That's when you saw the photo of me covered in ice and snow. That's here. <laughs> so on that day. So they're walking around and uh, after the mating, uh, they are both really tired. So they're both resting on the ice. That's the female. And this is the male again eating snow. I think maybe also it helps to relax the pain from the canine. That's one thing that I'm thinking. And here is the seal. And that's the seal pup. So if the mating is successful, the female will enter a sustained pregnancy. Sustained pregnancy, meaning that the eggs won't be implanted in the uterus 
but they're gonna wait for about two months, and only after two months, if the female has enough body fat to sustain the pregnancy, the embryos will start to, de to, develop, to, de to develop, to evolve. And then she's gonna give birth in December in the dark period. So that's our male. You can see the broken canine and the bleeding wounds. Okay, this is part of the mating. So he's kind of controlling the female, making sure that she goes only where he allows her to go. Uh, the mating itself, of course. Arctic fox. Um, they do love to yawn. And of course, in summertime, everything looks different. So in the winter, I'm guiding photography workshops with three people only on snowmobiles. In the summertime, I'm chartering a boat. Okay, so you can see the boat here, just um, stuck in the ice. We're waiting for the bears to come. Uh, so the bear is in the uh, the boat is in the ice, and that's a small boat, 12 people boat, that allows us to get closer to the animals and be free of most of the regulations in Svalbard. So here you can see a bear and our boat behind him. That's a male bear. I call this photo uh, dreaming of sea ice. Okay, because the polar bear relies on sea ice to hunt. Without sea ice, they will go extinct. Uh, so he really trusts his sea ice. He really loves his sea ice, so he can sleep on it. So that's, uh, he has two bodyguards, uh, one grounded and one airborne. Okay, so that's a cub, polar bear cub. Uh, this is a family, a mother and two cubs. Um, and this image has also won a lot of awards, including the Picture of the Year award. Um, so to get that, that photo, I had to get real low and photograph it from a really low angle uh, with a, using a 24 millimeter lens to show the surrounding and the edge of the ice. Okay, so these are the bears, again, at a wide angle lens. Uh, this photo, I called it Arctic Angel. So that's an ivory gull. And they actually follow polar bears for not really a romantic reason, they just eat their feces. <laughs> okay, so you know what that is? Uh, so walrus, exactly. So walrus is one of my favorite creatures in Svalbard. Okay, I just look at walruses and I can't stop smiling. They're, very, they're, they're just magnificent creatures. And their biology is so fascinating. Again, we don't have time to talk about all the biology, also the polar bear's biology, but they are absolutely fascinating. So this is a big male sitting uh, in the summertime. Of course, there's no ice in that area. Um, but this one is from uh, far away. This is with a 500 millimeter lens. Okay, which I don't really like shooting wildlife with a big tele lens. I like shooting wildlife, photographing wildlife with a wide angle lens. So I did. So that's how it looks like with a 24 to 70 millimeter lens. Okay, so people always ask me, what's my favorite wildlife photography lens? It's the 24 to 70 millimeter. That's my favorite wildlife lens. Okay, the, you know the famous saying that if your pictures are not good enough, you're not close enough. The thing with wide angle is that they allow you to get not only the animal, but also its surrounding. To so not just get an animal in the portrait, just saying you and the chairs behind you, but I can go, and go closer and then I can see the entire room with the context. So here you can see the fjord behind the, the walruses. If I would have shot this with a tele lens, I would get only um, this area, just behind the walrus, and that's it, and nothing besides that. And then I wanted to get closer. So that's a photo of a walrus, uh, again, coming in from low, getting a really nice uh, perspective of the walrus and the surrounding of the fjord. Here you can see the walrus is swimming, that's taken with a drone, okay? So uh, with a drone, I mean, walruses are actually attracted to drones. They are curious. So they, they just follow the drone. So when I launch a drone, they start swimming towards it. So I can bring the walruses towards me <laughs> with the drone. So I'm like a walrus herder kind of thing. 
Um, that's uh, an Arctic Fox pup. Okay, uh, so that pup is uh, part of a family of a big family of uh, Arctic foxes, and they reside always below a bird cliff. So whenever the birds fall down, the mother fox catches them and brings them to the to the pups. And the birds that they don't eat, they just bury in the ground, in the permafrost. So the ground is frozen. So it's putting like food in the freezer. And then in the winter time, the foxes come out, come back and retrieve their deposits. Okay, they did a research, I read, I read it recently. There was a research about the success rate of the Arctic foxes finding their food deposits in the permafrost. Okay, can you guess what's their success rate? How many of the birds that they buried in the ground can they find in the winter time? That's absolutely right. You read that research? Just a guess. That was an accurate guess. 30%. What are the chances? So 30% uh, of the things that they bury, they can retrieve later. So pups are playing catch. I mean, they always remind me of my kids because they're very active, my kids as well. So you can see here the three pups playing and one in the background. Uh, of course, they love to hug and cuddle. Um, and one more thing about Svalbard that we can't go there without photographing is the changes that are happening so fast. So this is the, uh, the ice cap in North Ausland that's melting. And it's melting really fast. So I'm also photographing a lot of uh, glaciers with the drone to show their retreat. Okay, so I can see over time where that glacier has been and where it's now. So that's one more project, long-term project that I'm doing. And one more thing that you can really say, tell that the water is nice and warm is when you swim in it. <laughs> so I'm swimming here. Uh, the water is 0 0.5 degrees centigrade, which is, I don't know, 33 degrees Fahrenheit, which is pretty cold. Um, yeah, but you, you got to the water in order to connect with nature uh, plus if you're if you're tired you jump in the water you immediately wake up <laughs> okay sure. that's for sure yeah <laughs> and of course I'm doing a lot of environmental work so I'm also I'm a Greenpeace ambassador so uh, as a Greenpeace ambassador I'm taking banners renting, raising awareness and photographing the climate change um, I'm part of campaigns to uh, raise awareness to oil and gas drilling by the Norwegian government in the North Pole, near the North Pole. Uh, even Greenpeace sued, sued the Norwegian government in court to stop uh, the violation of the Svalbard Treaty in terms of oil and gas searching, and also uh, a campaign to create the Antarctic Ocean Sanctuary, which we'll talk about it later. All the footage that you saw before was filmed as part of the BBC film called Snow Bears. So Snow Bears is a great film. I really recommend you to watch it. I really suggest you watch it. Snow Bears, it's narrated by Kate Winslet, which is, she's an amazing actress. Okay, if you don't know Kate Winslet, she's from the Titanic. She has good experience with ice. Okay? So uh, she's narrating. I'm one of four cinematographers or, who worked on that film. And now I'm going to show you a promo for the film. So. All the, uh, all the polar bears that you see in this promo are my footage. Uh, the seals are not my footage. Okay, so let's watch. Every 30 minutes, the seals must take a breath and she'll be waiting. This lesson is all about patience. The female cub seems to be taking the lesson seriously. One day, she'll have her own young to feed. Her brother prefers making snowballs. At last, the waiting is over. But it's the wrong hold. So uh, that's the promo of the film Snow Bears. You should watch it. I'm very biased, but it's a great film. Um, 
And it also won several awards, uh, which one of them is excellence in photography, and the rest I care less about. But uh, photography part is good. So if you remember, about 15 minutes ago, I told you about the, the, the situation, the scene where the bear approached me, and we had to leave immediately. Right. And, I, and I couldn't photograph it because I didn't have a camera with me. I left everything behind. So it happened again last year. And, but this time, I knew what's going to happen. And then I took one of the cameras with me. So I have something to photograph with. And then I photographed this photo. <laughs> so that, this is the bear that you saw mating. So after he mated, wow. it was finished mating, he went around the fjord. And you know, bears are really curious. They're really smart. They're really intelligent. And this guy, he knows what people are, but he's curious about this gear, the toys that we're bringing with us. And every time we just hug them and, and we look for them. And, and every time he just sees us playing around with these toys. And he was curious about what are these things. So he's walking around, he's checking us out. He's walking around, he's checking us out. And then suddenly he just makes a straight turn, walks toward us. And that's when we had to escape, leave everything behind. And then he just came there. He just looked through the viewfinder. Uh, actually, the female is over there. <laughs> Maybe he was looking at the female. Uh, come on, I'll, give you, I'll do your portrait. We know the photographer's tricks, yeah. Um, so he's looking for the viewfinder, and then he just walks away. He didn't harm the cameras. He didn't knock them over. He didn't do anything. He was gentle. He was smart. He appreciated the fact that it's Nikon. <laughs> okay, so uh, yeah, he's a good guy, and uh, he continued the way. So that's the way uh, I look like there. Uh, that's uh, me on the right, and these are the three people that I'm guiding in the workshops. Um, and and the background, by the way, that's uh, Longibian, the city, the capital of Svalbard. So that's Longibian. So we got. We got three more destinations that I want to take you to, and we don't have a lot of time. Okay, so now we go straight to the other, other side of the world, Antarctica. Okay, has anyone been to Antarctica? You, you've been everywhere. I, I, I understand your, you as well. Cool. Uh, you've been to South Georgia as well? You have, but you haven't been to Antarctica? Yeah, I've been to Antarctica. Ah, you've been? Oh, both. Okay, that's good. Okay, the rest, you should go. So <laughs> Antarctica is literally the edge of the world, South Georgia and Antarctica. Uh, and so it's, uh, I'm going to start with South Georgia. So South Georgia is a British territory. Uh, it's just in the South, South, South Atlantic and within the Antarctic Convergence, the, the currents that circle Antarctica. And that's one of the biggest penguin colonies in the world. So we got a lot of king penguins nesting here at the, at the beaches, at the plains of South Georgia. These entire areas were covered with glaciers and now melted away. This is St. Andrews. So this is, again, a colony of king penguins. And uh, you can see the glacier behind. So that glacier on the mountain behind them actually reached all the way to the ocean and receded that much. Okay, so <clears throat> the colonies of the king penguins are fascinating. They're really noisy. They're really smelly. Okay, uh, but it's such an amazing experience to watch. So uh, this is the colony. The ones you see in the front, these are the brown ones are the younger, young, youngsters, the chicks. So the adults just push them to the side of the colonies because they're very noisy and I can get them. Okay, and, and they just keep them on the side. And every young, every chick knows to identify their parents thanks to their singing. So they have a very distinct singing, each and every one of them. And that's how they can dif differ, can they find their parents among all of these other penguins. For us, it all sounds the same. Okay, but for them, they know the difference. Uh, so this is an adolescent. So this is a teenager. Okay, they're really cranky. And you can see he's just he's removing the, the, uh, the plumage, the brown plumage, from his face now. 
So it's really cranky because I think it's really itching. That's the way it looks. So that's why if you are come near a teenager, they will just start pecking at you because they're really aggressive. The adults, they don't really care. But the youngsters, they're terrible. So that's mating. Okay, you can see the, that's the male on top, the female on the bottom. Uh, so they are beautiful birds, beautiful birds in their surrounding. It's a paradise for penguins, uh, except for this guy. This is a skewer, a brown skewer, this guy here. So this is kind of, for me, it's the bad, bad guy. They're not bad and good in nature, I know, but I'm rooting for team penguin. Uh, and this guy, the, the skewer, actually attacks the penguins and eats their eggs, devours their eggs, and just swallows their cheek whole, just swallowing it. Uh, so this guy, the penguins really hate the skewers that go around them. Uh, the males, of course, they got the eggs, so they have a little bit uh, of excess skin, and then they can dot the eggs and just walk around with the eggs on their feet. Uh, this is their singing, you can hear it just about now. Okay, you can hear it? So again, this is the, their landscape, that's their territory, that's their home. Uh, that's the way I'm photographing there, so I'm on the ground photographing, there's another penguin behind me, he also clicked a couple of shots of my boot. I'm also photographing the fur seals. Uh, you can see the pups, see this pup is just nibbling at my feet, at my legs. Uh, two pups playing like macho, Italian macho, yeah. <laughs> that's a female, really aggressive. And that's a blonde pup, the cutest thing I've ever seen. So again, pups are cute regardless. That's a team, a gang, playing around. That's our blondie again. She's tired, she's going to sleep. So, this is, the next image is a photo of anti-racism. <laughs> Just to show that we are all equal, like Benetton stuff. And of course, this is for comparison. Just to, 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 so you see the size, that the pups are so small. I'm really curious. The adults are really more aggressive. Uh, so the funniest animal in the world for me is the elephant seal. Because they look kind of human and they make the funniest faces. The next photo I'm going to show you, I called it um, the three tenors. So that's a gentle penguin coming out of the water. Uh, that's an a uh, male tried to attack me, so I had to leave my camera behind and went away. So, uh, Antarctica is uh, the tallest, coldest, driest continent in the world. Okay, it's the seventh continent. Everything about it is extreme. Uh, at, the, at, the, at the South Pole, the ice cap is three kilometers thick. Okay, uh, and again, everything about it is extreme. But it's also why it's so fragile. It's so, um, it's changing so fast. So these guys are the Adelie penguins. Okay, Adelie penguins. And these are the toughest penguins on the planet. Okay, actually, they, they, they are two species of penguins that can survive winter in Antarctica. One is the Adelie penguin and the other is the emperor penguin. Okay, these are the only two that survive winter in Antarctica. So the Adelie penguin, the mother has two eggs, and out of them comes two chicks. And the mother starts running away from the chicks. And only the one that catches up gets food, the other doesn't. Only one of the two will survive, the other will die. And that it sounds harsh or cruel maybe for us, but that's nature. And that's a way to ensure that only the strongest survive. Okay, when the Delhi penguins uh, want to jump in the water, they come to the edge of the cliff or the edge of the ice and they look over the cliff and they see if there is something there. If there is nothing there, they will push one of them in the water. And then if there is a, a lot of blood coming out, spewing, 
they know that something is dangerous down there. And then no one will go in. If there's nothing happening, if, if the, that penguin that was shoved in the water, pushed in the water, swims happily, they will all jump in the water. Okay? And of course, they do more and more and more things. One of the things they do is, it's also fascinating, uh, the female selects a male that has a good nest. And they build nests out of pebbles. Okay, because the pebbles can uh, insulate from the cold ground, so there's air, and that way you can insulate because you don't have any branches or leaves, there's no trees there, so pebbles are used to build to building nests. So the female select, chooses the male with an, a male with an impressive nest, and she mates with him, and then the male goes to sea and to bring to to hunt for fish to eat or for a krill. And uh, then when, when he goes away, she goes around and mates with other males to get pebbles from them. So she mates with them, they pay her in pebbles, and she puts those pebbles in her nest and builds her nest even bigger and larger. So when the male comes back, he looks at the nest and it was like this when he left, and now it's like this. And he's like, I don't want to know what happened. I, I don't want to know how, how, how the nest grew so much. But he knows. Okay, so again, that's the way things work in Antarctica, because you got to survive. And here you can see a mother and a chick, and, and you can see that offspring of her is covered with ice. So she cleans the ice. She stands on top of him, so he can't move. This is like me when I'm putting a diaper on my kid. And then you see, she, and then he can try stand up and, and, and walk around. This is Jinn penguins. Okay, so that's a mother and her offspring. She's feeding him. Can you see that? That's feeding. So these are brush tail penguins. You can see the tail is like a brush. So that's a you know, deli penguin jumping between chunks of ice. Uh, this is a Jinto penguin mother feeding her chicks. Uh, that's a chin strap penguin, chin strap penguin. Uh, that's the beaches, that's how they look, uh, the ocean. This is a leopard seal. This guy is injured actually. He, one of his uh, back flippers was bitten off by an orca, probably. Uh, that's a whale, a humpback whale look. That's the mouth. So they're bubble net feeding in this amazing bay in Antarctica called Wilhelmina Bay. And that's for scale. So you can see the whale and our boat. Uh, this is the mo one of the most amazing sunsets I've ever seen. It's in Antarctica and the sun is setting over the horizon. And, and there was a cloud casting a shadow on this glacier, on this iceberg. So the iceberg came out with a really bluish color and the background came out really red thanks to the setting sun. Uh, just for scale, if you can look here, those pixels over here, these are Adelie penguins. Okay, just getting ready for a night's rest over here. So this iceberg is pretty big. Okay, and also here, like in the North Pole, I was challenged by a friend. Okay, and this friend told me, listen, if you can swim in the same year in the North Pole and near the South Pole, then you have a bipolar personality. <laughs> okay, so of course I did it. So I'm officially bipolar, <laughs> but you, you have to do it because you're there. So. Of course, one of the campaigns I'm doing for Greenpeace is, uh, is this one. Uh, so the, I want to read the entire thing because we don't have time. Such a but you can look it up online. In the middle of a very crowded, loud, and frankly quite smelly penguin colony. So this is I a campaign to create the Antarctic, the Antarctic Ocean Sanctuary. So this ocean sanctuary is about 1.8 million square kilometers of ocean to protect the krill. The krill is the base of the entire ecosystem, the entire food chain protected against human harvesting. So this campaign was very successful. And of course, uh, it resulted in 85% of the krill boats making a commitment not to act in the water of Antarctica, which is an amazing result. 
So now, I'm, without further ado, I'm going to take you to another of my favorite places. And this is Kamchatka. Has anyone been to Kamchatka? No, you haven't? <laughs> I thought you've been everywhere. <laughs> so, uh, Kamchatka is an amazing place. It's a peninsula in the eastern part of Russia. So it's just a, the other side of the Bering Strait. This is just, just near Alaska. Okay, this is the other side of the Bering Strait. So Kamchatka is uh, around over 100,000 over 100, square miles in size. So it's pretty large, but there are only 320,000 people living there. Okay, which is not a lot. Most of them live in the capital of Kamchatka, which is Petropavlov Kamchatsky. Okay, I'll let you practice on that later. So it's really nice in the summertime, it's plus 20 degrees, plus 70 degrees Fahrenheit. In the wintertime, it's about uh, zero Fahrenheit, minus 10 Fahrenheit. So the way there, we arrive from Moscow, we fly domestic flight, a domestic flight from Moscow to Petropavlov Kamchatsky. That's a nine hour flight domestic. Nine hours flight within the same country. Okay, that shows you just how big Russia really is. But if you think nine hours is long, think about it that before air, airline travel, to get to Kamchatka was about six months of travel by foot or by horse. Okay, and in the, in the 19th century, there were 40% mortality rate. So 100 people went on the road, only 60 arrived. So suddenly, nine hours flight is not that bad, <laughs> okay? Uh, still, even today, there is, you can't get to Kamchatka with roads. There are no roads to Kamchatka. You gotta get, to, if you wanna go by road, you gotta get to Vladivostok in Russia, and from there you take a ferry, and then you can go with your car to Kamchatka. But you can't drive to Kamchatka, there is no road. You can go off-road, another story. But if you want to go in by road, you can. So the way there, we fly to Petrovalov Kamchatsky. We take a helicopter. So we go on this Mi-8, Mi-8 helicopter. Uh, and actually, you see here the, the bicycle for the pilot, which is really nice and cute. The, bicycle, the, the pilot is coming with a bicycle. Uh, I, saw, I saw there is a, a mechanic, an airborne me mechanic on board the helicopter. Okay? So there's a pilot, a second pilot, and a mechanic. So I see the mechanic is opening the hood, the engine cover, and start banging with a hammer on the engine, or what I thought is the engine. Uh, I'm asking this guy, uh, is everything okay? Because I'm, I'm kind of concerned. So he tells me in a Russian accent, uh, you prefer I know check? I say, no, check, check. <laughs> okay, but is it safe? So he's telling me, 40 years, no crash. Why today? <laughs> Which is, is good in statistics, yeah. So, he's right. <laughs> so we flew, of course. We flew from Petropavlov Kamchatsky to Lake Kuril. Lake Kuril in southern Kamchatka, it's a nature reserve, the entire southern Kamchatka. So we fly, this is inside the helicopter, this is the assistant pilot. This is the air condition, you open the window. Okay, and we landed. So Lake Kuril is a volcanic caldera. It erupted in uh, 6400 BC, and the, the eruption was so strong, the shockwave went around, went around the world three times. It's about the same strength of eruption as Santorini in Greece, which destroyed the, uh, the Minoic uh, Empire. Um, so that, the area is 77 square kilometers, there's 300 meters deep, but this is mostly known as the second largest salmon spawning site in the world. Okay, and there is a lot of salmon there. Only 2,000 people arrive there every year, so that's me, and there are some bears around me. Uh, and the bears are there, to feed on the salmon. 
because they got to eat as many salmon as they can to get enough weight before the winter's hibernation. So the next image I'm going to show you is salmon, which I took with a drone. So that's a lot of salmon. Or as somebody said in the previous talk, that's a lot of sushi. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so these salmons come here to spawn. And then I thought to myself, it would be so cool if I had a bear just here in the middle of all these salmon. So I did. <laughs> so that's a bear. And for some reason, the salmon are keeping a distance from the bear. So the salmons are eaten by the bear. The bear are just there for the salmons. You have volcanoes around. Each bear has its own hunting technique. Some of the bears like to eat their remains on the shores of the lake. Some of the bears like to run in the shallows and catch salmon swimming upstream. You can see the salmon over here. And the bear is chasing the salmon in the shallows. Some like to go for the deeper water, like this one, this guy. So he's there. This is, just, this is a symbol of motivation, of perseverance. This guy stops for nothing. He ate 40 salmons in front of me during the day and he succeeded so many times and a happy and that's a happy bear not so happy salmon <laughs> actually this image was on the cover of wildlife for uh, the wildlife uh, photographic and this image was on the cover of Nikon Pro magazine um, yeah so there's a lot of covers that I forgot to mention before but uh, you can look it up on my website. So that's a video with a drone. You can see the salmon swimming. And here you can see the masses of salmon when I went up with the drone higher. And that's the way the bears sit in the water, like you saw before in that photo. And they wait for the salmons to come closer and catch something. So the bear is standing near the shore. As you can see the salmon start running around. And he just comes and chooses which one he wants. And lunch. It's that simple. <laughs> <laughs> For them, it's like it's an endless buffet. So I'm photographing the bears in Lake Kuril. And this is an amazing place to photograph because the bears play fight and they real fight. And they have some romantic moments, as you can see here. I like photographing the mothers and cubs. And you can see, again, the connection between mothers and cubs, like we saw with the polar bears. Uh, I love the stories, the family stories, like you can see here within, between the two families of bears. Uh, within the same family, you can have fights. So these are two brothers fighting for the salmon, and the third brother took the salmon and he's hiding behind the mother. That's a big mother. So to get those kinds of images, I'm laying really low on the ground. Okay, I'm just getting as low as I can to get those. The mother is guarding her, her cub because the alpha male is trying to attack cubs. Because as long as mothers have cubs, they won't mate. And that's why a lot of predators in the wild, males kill cubs. Not just bears, but also a lot of others. Males kill cubs. Because as long as the mother is breastfeeding, the body produces prolactin, which is a, a hormone which stops the ovulation. And then with the ovulation, the mother is not in heat, and she won't mate. Only when she stops breastfeeding, that's when her body knows she can mate. And that's why the males kill the cubs, not for cruelty or for fun. Okay, they kill them because that's the way they can trans get their genes onward to the next generation. And that's what nature is all about. Uh, again, families of bears, that's a baby bear playing in his playground, playing with toys to be or not to be. <laughs> to fish or not to fish. That's another bear. 
that's a split image, half above water, half below water. Okay, so this is a photo that shows all of Kamchatka in one frame. So here I've got the volcano in the background, which is a symbol of Kamchatka, uh, the lenticular clouds at sunset, mother bear and her cub. Uh, we've got the lake and also have a salmon here jumping out of the water, just to be as part, part of the image. So I told Sergey, Sergey is the local inspector, I told Sergey I want to get closer, 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 because I, I like to be close. So this is with a 24 to 70 millimeter lens. This is about five meters away from the bears. Okay? So I told Sergey I want to get closer. Sergey said, no, you cannot do this. This will be an image of a lifetime, the last one. <laughs> okay, that's what he said. So, uh, yeah, he's right. So he can't get closer. So I'm getting lower. So I'm getting in the water. I'm wearing waders, which is fisherman's pants, OK? That keeps me dry. And then I can shoot in the water. By the way, this is the Nikon 500 millimeter F5.6 PF, the new one, which is really awesome. And then I can get these kinds of images. So I'm shooting from really low. And then I'm shooting I'm below the bear if you look at the height level. But I wanted to get closer, and Sergei says, no, but I want yes. So what do I do? I start working with remote triggers. So I place my camera. Uh, that's another one from uh, the participants of the workshop. So I'm placing my camera um, with a remote trigger, and I have the, the remote, this is the receiver, I have the transmitter in my hand. So I place the, the, the camera, I have the composition set, I have everything ready, and all I have to do now is wait, wait for the right moment, and then click. Okay, and then I got the image I wanted, but I wanted more. So I place my camera on the shores of the lake, waited for the bear to come, and click. And that's a lot more interesting way more impressive than shooting from far away. You're getting families up close. This is with a 14 millimeter lens. So I'm also trying to do some black and white. This guy, this guy looks like a human in a bear suit <laughs> for me. Okay, of course, not only bears, but also foxes. This is a red fox, a female. Uh, and, of course, we also went by catamaran, by a boat, to Ruskaya Buchta. This is the catamaran at sunset. We spent the night in Ruskaya Buchta. And then in the morning, I flew a drone, and you can see uh, where we woke up at. Okay, so this is the area, the coastal regions of Kamchatka. This is the catamaran we had. And this is sea lion that we photographed at sunrise. This one didn't wake up. So a lot of uh, sea lions and, of course, orcas. Orcas swim really fast. So the catamaran could not keep up with the orcas swimming. So we had to, I, what I did is launch my drone again. I flew the drone. The drone can go 70 kilometers an hour, which is, I don't know, 50 miles an hour. And, um, and with that, I could catch up with the orcas and get, again, the wide angle uh, photos that I want, because the drone is a wide angle. So I just flew close and low and got these images. And this is from the boat with a tele lens. So with the tele lens, with a 500 millimeter, it looks completely different than this one. Right. You can see the difference? Yep. That's why I like wide angle lenses. Uh, puffin, this is our uh, Pacific puffins, crest puffins. And, of course, we've drawn some other shots. Flowers. And now I'm going to show you a video I took in Kamchatka. Uh, some of it is from the ground and some of it with a drone. Okay, so let's see.
Okay, Kamchatka. So, uh, yeah, Kamchatka is an amazing place. I'm fascinated by it. Every time I go there, it's brand new. Everything is exciting. Uh, and one last place I'm going to take you with me today is Tanzania. Have you, of course, many of you have been there. Who has been? Just the two of you? You're the frequent flyers of the room, yeah. OK. So Tanzania is the heart of Africa. It's Eastern Africa, of course, the Serengeti. Uh, and uh, Tanzania has uh, the last great migration on Earth. So the sunrise in Tanzania is where all the action happens. I don't understand when people go to Tanzania and sleep at sunrise. <laughs> there are people who wake up at 7 a.m., have breakfast, and go out to the field at 9.30. I mean, all the action stops at 8.30. I mean, sunrise, Tanzania, sunrises, that's when the action happens. So this is a nice herd at sunrise. Uh, of course, the savanna is always packed full of animals. You can see here, that's a herd of elephants. And uh, here's a giraffe walking in the savanna. And here's another herd of elephants over here. So everywhere is action, action, action. Never stops. Uh, so of course, it's going to start with lions, Okay, the king of the jungle, so to speak. Uh, and every time I'm photographing lions, there is always a story going on. And it can be this kind of couples therapy kind of thing. And it can be like these two males, like two brothers with no pride, literally, uh, no pride. Uh, they're just whining about their <laughs> poor destination, destiny. Uh, that's mating, again, mating, a male and a female. So that's taken with the 24 millimeter lens. I was three meters away, 10 feet away from them. So it's pretty close. Uh, just to get that perspective of the, of the savanna. Uh, of course, uh, mating is not that interesting unless you're into that kind of thing. But what's interesting is what happens after the mating. After the mating, the female will try to ha attack the male. And then you get images like that. Okay, so if you missed it, don't worry about it. Wait 15 minutes, they will do it again. So lions mate every 15 minutes four times an hour, 24 hours a day, 100 matings, mating acts per day for five days in a row. So you're going to get 500 matings happening. <laughs> so it's really easy, really easy to capture images like this once you find a mating couple. OK, you just got to wait, and you can have a photograph like 10 matings and just choose the best one. Of course, the result of mating is the little cubs. So this is the mother uh, raising her cubs. Uh, you can see this cub is really loves it. The, really, the cub really loves its mother, but the mother is so tired, just leave me alone, like every mother knows uh, this kind of feeling. Uh, this is the vegetarian uh, lion, uh, but it didn't last long. Uh, so that's another young lion playing around with its food. So that's a spring hare. And I love photographing animals playing around with their food because, I mean, food is a big part of life. Uh, that's a big male. It's a portrait of a big uh, lion male. And one of the, the thing I want to show you next is one of the most amazing things I've, saw, I've seen in Africa. And that was in last March almost a year ago, and I was there uh, in the morning in Tawangiri National Park, and I'm driving and I'm seeing this pride of lion lying on the ground with the bellies full. What does that mean? They've eaten, they had something big to eat if everyone's so full that they can't even move. And I'm looking around and I can't see what they've been eating. So I'm waiting there for like three, four minutes. I'm just trying to find whatever the food is. And suddenly one of the younger lions gets up, 
he walks five five paces stops look at me does like this and and goes into the bush enters the bush okay so we're driving around the bush with the car and that's what i saw so that's a lion eating an elephant's head so this lion posed perfectly for my shots so of course after that i immediately asked the park rangers did you know there's a dead elephant around because uh, I was worried about that it might be poachers because he didn't have a face because the poachers cut off the, the, the face for the tusks so uh, the ranger said yeah yeah we know don't worry about it this elephant died of natural causes and we cut off the face so poachers won't get their hands on the ivory okay so that's the back story of the of this photo here so I mean that's uh, quite a moment that I had in Africa. Uh, what's that? Do you know? Gazelle. Oh, gazelle, you said? No, no it's a cat. <laughs> no, not lynx. It's like a lynx. You're right, but it's not a cerebral cat. It's a caracal. Caracal. So this is a caracal, a beautiful cat. And this. This is a servo cat. That's a servo cat. And here you see a courtship between a male jackal and a female jackal. And a lizard. <laughs> that's a lizard. So that's an agama lizard, if you want to be more precise. So what happens here is the male shows the female the lizard. And he like goes like, look, lizard, 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 and throws away the lizard. The female goes to pick up the lizard, and then the male mounts her. Uh, elephants, of course. Uh, the African elephant is the largest land mammal alive today. Okay? So this is a, an African elephant, a male, walking around in the savanna, in the Serengeti. And at the end of the day, it's just a spot in the Serengeti. The Serengeti is huge. And you can look here at this photo that the elephant is alone in this entire savanna. But in the sky, there's a lot of elephants. OK, there are a lot of clouds, which look like. So that's another elephant under an acacia tree. Uh, giraffes and a zebra imposter. OK, giraffes are also fascinating animals. Uh, their biology is super, super interesting. Uh, from their heart, which has doubled the blood pressure of humans. It's uh, 10 kilograms, 20 pounds weight, 60 centimeters long, which is two feet long. Uh, they have special valves in their arteries, in their neck, so when the giraffes drink, the blood won't go to their head. They have tight skin on their legs to get the blood flowing back up. I mean, everything about their biology is fascinating. Do you know what's the scientific name of a giraffe? Cameleopardis. Camel, it's like it's a camel. And le leopard is a leopard. So it's coming from Greek. Pardis, pard cheetah in, in, in Greek is pardalis, like spotted one. Leopard, leopard, is spotted lion and giraffe is spotted lion camel <laughs> so you can, when, when you understand the name you can see how people came to understanding of what these things are by the way the first giraffe in Europe was introduced by the house of Medici in Italy in the Middle Ages so it was uh, considered like a mythical creature Again, there's a lot of stories to tell you about giraffes. It's really fascinating, but we don't have time for all of that now. Giraffe at sunrise. Uh, that's a leopard, a female. And that's another female eating a young wildebeest. A portrait. That's a mother and a cub. 
And this cub is so sweet. I was photographing it all day long. Uh, he climbed the tree and was stuck. He couldn't come down, so he was whining for his mother. That's him. He was crying, and mother leopard climbed up and just pushed him down. <laughs> so, <laughs> you got to come down somehow. So, it's, yeah. uh, so, so they came down from the tree. Uh, that's another uh, male leopard. He was also curious, like the polar bear. He was curious about my camera. Uh, likewise, uh, that's a water buck in a portrait, just at sunset. And of course, birds. So we have flamingos, uh, vultures. I call this photo uh, Fly Me to the Moon after Frank Sinatra. Uh, that's a landing vulture. So a lot of things about wildlife photography is about predicting what's going to happen and, and then planning your shot, OK, and then taking it. So prediction. I, I knew that, I know that uh, uh, the, I saw the vultures circling and flying down. And I know that vultures must land against the wind. So I saw that happening. We drove over there. We saw a carcass of an antelope. So we went back about 10 meters, uh, 30 feet away. I aimed my camera when the wind is blowing from my back towards the antelope carcass. So the vultures must land in front of me. And then I know, I know that when they land, all I have to do is click, 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 and I got the photo that I wanted. So first it's prediction, then it's planning. So I knew what I want to get. And then the third is execution. So you got to set all the correct parameters. You got to set the focus in, in continuous. You got to set the right focus mode. You got to set the right aperture. You don't want it too open, or the depth of field will be too shallow, and then the vulture will get out of focus too fast, and maybe the focus can track it that fast. Uh, you got to get enough shutter speed, enough ISO. You got to get everything set, and that's the execution part. And then all you have to do is just click, click, click. So this image is really easy to capture. Okay, once you see something like that happen. Okay? Um, sunset, of course, composition. Um, that's an, a hippo. Uh, this is the most dangerous animal in Africa, of course, it's for humans, uh, except for humans. <laughs> humans are the most dangerous animal in Africa, or everywhere. But uh, besides humans, hippos. So uh, this is a hippo in the pool. Um, of course, hyenas, uh, they have really bad reputation, but they're really interesting animals. Um, I love the families. I love the little ones, the baby hyenas. They are the cutest. Uh, and of course, the savanna, which is always beautiful. That's, that's a buffet here. So this is Ndutu area. So Ndutu is an area in southern Serengeti but it's part of the Ngorongoro Conservation Area. Okay, so here you can see the acacia tree, and that's uh, Kilima Matiti, and this is Ngorongoro Caldera, the range. Okay, and here you have all the gazelles and the zebras and everything going on. So that is the playground. And the good thing about Dutu, when you go there in February or Mar March, March, that this is the calving season. So 250,000 wildebeest give birth to their offspring, to their young. And all the predators are gathering around for the buffet. OK, so you've got a lot of action. The great migration is there. Uh, but the thing is about uh, Ndutu, unlike the Serengeti, in Ndutu you can go off-road. In the Serengeti, you cannot. So in Ndutu, you can go wherever, almost wherever you want. Uh, so I'm here because I'm interested in the cheetahs. The cheetahs are one of my most uh, intense projects that I'm photographing. So this is the cheetah. It's the world's fastest land animal. Okay, and can reach a speed of 115, 120 kilometers an hour, which is, I don't know, 70 miles an hour, I think, ish. <laughs> um, so, and of course, the, the family behavior, so you have mother and, and her little cubs. Uh, that's a male after lunch. Uh, the cubs are playing around. You can see how the right one is uh, blessing the one on the left. 
<laughs> give him his blessing. So this mother has to eat, and cheetahs, cheetah mothers must eat every day or two because they have cubs. If they don't have cubs, they can go every three days, four days. But she must hunt every day or two. If she didn't hunt yesterday, she must hunt today. So you know that if you see a cheetah with a full belly, you won't try to follow it because she's not going to hunt. And by the way, I really prefer following the females rather than the males because the female has a much greater success rate than the males. So cheetah, most of the animals, females are better than the males. Sorry, guys. Most of the animals, females are better than the males because the males always only take care of themselves and the, the females have to take care of themselves plus raise cubs, plus protect them, plus breastfeed, plus being pregnant and hunting. I mean, males, everything is easy for them. They even hunt in pairs, like two brothers. Females are always solitary. <laughs> okay, so it's really tough being a female. So the male can be successful one in 10 times, female can be successful three out of 10 times. So it's almost three times as much success rate. So that's why I like following the females because I know that they're much better hunters. Uh, so she, this female has to hunt. Uh, so I photographed her hunting. So I called this photo, uh, run for your life. Because uh, they both are running for their lives. This cheetah hasn't eaten for three days. And she has two cubs. So she really must hunt. She's really starving. Uh, so she has to succeed. Uh, of course, the gazelle is very frightened. You can see her look. She's panicking. And the cheetah is really focused. And the story about this photo is this thing here. You see that? The rock. So this rock was kicked by the gazelle, kicked up in the air, almost hit the cheetah in her face, in her eyes, in her right eye, and missed it by inches. And as the, the rock is still in the air, the cheetah just ran underneath the rock. So, I mean, again, watching this, it was like, you know, full-blown action in milliseconds. Of course, this is the grip of death. So when the cheetah gets her claws in, the gazelle can no longer escape. And Dinner is served. This is another, another interesting story. This hyena tried to attack the cheetah's cubs. The cheetah didn't give up without a fight. She attacked the hyena. But the hyena is way bigger and stronger than the cheetah. The cheetah is not strong. It's flexible, it's fast, but it's not strong. The hyena is really strong. So she managed to chase the hyena away for 10 seconds until he remembered that he's, he was stronger than her, and he just attacked her back, but she and her cubs managed to escape. So she bought the cubs enough time for them to escape the hyena. And here they're watching the hyena eat, eating their dinner, their food. So this is a really rare photo. Here you can see a mother and four grown-up cubs, because 95 0.2% of cheetahs won't make it to the age of two years old. Most of them will die before that. Mostly because of other predators like hyenas, lions, leopards that will kill cheetah cubs. Uh, some out of starvation because if the mother can't hunt then the cubs will die because she won't have milk. And the mother can survive but the cubs cannot survive without the mother. So the cubs will be the first to die in case of not enough food, in case of starvation. And then the mother can survive and then mate again and then have more cubs. And of course, other illnesses, diseases, uh, getting lost, which also happens, and so on and so on. Uh, now I'm going to show you a video that I took in Tanzania, shot in Tanzania. Also, some of it is from the ground, some of it is with a drone. So let's watch.
Okay, Tanzania. Uh, if you haven't been, yeah, I recommend you to go. <laughs> so um, this is what it looks like in Tanzania when photographing. So I'm traveling in, in the Jeep, the open top, looking, searching for animals. When we see them, we start photographing. And then also sometimes when accessible, when it's okay, you can get out of the car and get things like this. So this is the caracal that you saw before, okay? So I'm photographing, that's me, photographing the caracal. So that's the way it looks like behind the scenes, how some of my images are taken. So uh, before we finish, one more thing is, uh, of course, you're welcome to follow on uh, Instagram and on uh, Facebook and visit my website for more information or more photos of the one you saw. And uh, if you're interested in joining me on one of the workshops on the safaris, of course, you're welcome to have a look and contact me and I would be happy to have you on board. Because <laughs> it's, really, it's really fun. It might sound like it's tough, but it's fun. Uh, I love going out there. I love photographing the wildlife. I love doing uh, the videography project and the films that I'm working on. And I'm working on a bigger project and a bigger film, which is something that I cannot elaborate about yet. But I will when time comes uh, to be. And uh, of course, uh, thank you for uh, B&H for uh, having us here uh, at this awesome place, awesome shop. This is like the holy grail of photography. I mean, this is like photographers from all over the world come here. You know, just Danny told me that there are about 3,000 employees here, right? 3,000 employees. I mean, I was amazed. So anyway, Danny is one of them. Uh, <laughs> so thank you, Danny. And uh, thank you, everyone at home watching. And thank you, everyone here who came all the way in the middle of the workday. And now we have some time uh, for Q&A. So yeah, you have questions. Um, yeah. So I, uh, whenever I'm photographing with wide-angle lenses with the 2470, I have a polarizing filter on top of that. I don't use a polarizing filter on the 1424 because it's a really curved lens, and it's really you can put a polarizing filter on top of that, but it's really complicated, and the lens is kind of polarizing on its own, so it has a, that polarizing effect on its own uh, with the sky with the yeah, 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 with the sky, sky especially. Uh, so I'm using the polarizing filter on that. I don't use a polarizing filter on the telephoto lenses because uh, I need all the light that I can get. And of course, uh, polarizing filter, uh, you lose about one and a half stops of f stops of light. Um, so I, I do use it on my wide angle lens. Thank you. So the question is, I'm repeating the question for the people at home. We're still broadcasting, right? Yeah. So I'm repeating the question for the people at home. Uh, I've been asked that, how did I get my knowledge on wildlife, the animals in general, with some nice compliments. Thank you. Uh, well, I'm autodidact. I mean, I learned by myself everything. I didn't go to university or anything. I'm too hyperactive to sit in the class. But I, I'm, uh, whenever I'm photographing something, I feel obligated to know as much as I can on that animal. So I read a lot. I, I ask a lot. I talk to biologists because I'm also doing articles and I'm writing for several magazines. And when I do that, I have to research to find the, the in-depth information and the anecdotes uh, to make the story interesting. Uh, being a photographer, I have a photographic memory, <laughs> which helps. <laughs> so no, I'm kidding, but it's, uh, so I, I have to know as much as I can about everything that I photograph. And things that I didn't photograph yet, I know, I know very little of. Oh, about animals. Okay, ask me to tell you about the 
I don't know, Red Panda. I don't know what to tell you anything about the Red Panda because I didn't photograph the Red Panda yet. Uh, but once I will, I can give you a lecture of an hour and a half at least on the Red Panda. Like I can on walruses, polar bears, cheetahs, and, and the other animals that I've been working with. Also, I'm guiding. So I'm mean, the guide that also needs to know a lot about that. Yeah. So all those photographs are straight from the camera and you're just touching the the question is, uh, is all of my photographs straight out of the cameras with no retouching? Are you crazy? <laughs> no. <laughs> I think, uh, no, of course. Well, not, nobody, nobody publishes photos without any retouching. Because this is our darkroom. Okay, the Photoshop is our Lightroom. It's our darkroom. Lightroom is our darkroom. It's kind of oxymoron, yeah. But it's... Uh, the, the photo that comes out of the camera goes through the same algorithm wherever it was taken. I mean, it doesn't matter if you took a photo of your child or a polar bear or a lion. The, the, the same algorithm is applied in the camera on, for the, those images. But not every image is supposed to look the same way. The only one who knows how the image is supposed to look like after it was retouched is you, the photographer. So you know how to take what the camera produced, the raw file, which is raw, as its name suggests, okay, uh, and take that into the final result that you want to uh, um, show the world, okay? So you have to do uh, Lightroom or other software that you're using to, uh, for the adjustments which is uh, highlights, shadows, uh, whites, blacks, exposure, yada, 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 yada. And after that, I open it in Photoshop. And in Photoshop, I work a lot with Dodge and Burn, which Dodge makes lighter and Burn makes darker. It's a brush, so you, wherever you go. So I work with that a lot. And I also work, um, I mean, mostly with that. I don't ever, I, I'm, I'm obliged to the rules of photojournalism because I'm also I'm a photojournalist. I'm doing a lot of articles and also the, or the competition. So I have hundreds of awards and I've got to be in the terms of the competition. So I, 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 I'm obliged for the rules of the photojournalistic uh, world, which means that you can do adjustments, but you cannot add, remove, or whatever. You cannot do that uh, in an image. So if something is bothering you, either crop it out or deal with it or take another photo. But I, will ne I, ha I have never and I will never remove or add something to my photos when I'm editing in Photoshop. Oh, that's what you meant. Okay, no, so I don't add cheetahs in the photo, cheetah with a polar bear and a penguin. <laughs> no, I, I, I will not do that, no. Maybe for a children's book, but not even. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No. The rock is the entire story. I know. In this case, you can try it. Yeah, but even if it wasn't, even if it wasn't, I would not remove it. No. It is what it is. It is what it is. You cannot touch it. We, we are, as photographers, we are documenting reality. We can give reality our own interpretation because our perception of reality is subjective. I experience different from you and you and everyone else. We experience reality different. So we can give that interpretation to the photo in terms of composition, crop, uh, the, which moment you chose, how you chose to show it. That's our interpretation, <coughs> but we cannot create reality. Okay, that, that's, uh, well, you can, of course, I will not arrest you, but uh, it, it will not be photographic. It will be digital art. It will be something out of the photography world. Uh, and of course, it doesn't answer to the ethic, ethical questions of photography as photography. Okay? But it's very ph philosophical uh, question that we're getting into. Of course, I can elaborate on that, but that's my point of view. Yeah. 
You have another question? Yeah. <laughs> That's a long list. Yeah, but uh, so I'm, I'm going to be in Yellowstone next week. Uh, yeah, uh, photographing some bisons and hopefully some wolves. I'm going to be in Tanzania in March guiding a workshop. Uh, I'm guiding uh, Svalbard and snowmobiles in April. I still have one spot left if you want. I see you're still a traveler. So I have one spot left for that. I also I'm, uh, I have um, Svalbard in June, Svalbard in July, Alaska in September, uh, Yukon in October. Uh, yeah, well, you get, you get the idea. <laughs> and I've got four kids here in New York. <laughs> four boys. Yeah, we live not far from here. Well, I just came here walking. Yeah. So yeah, that, that's the upcoming project. But again, the, the list goes on for the next two years. I know where, where I'm going to be. So we're going to wrap things up. Uh, thank you, everyone at home. Thank you, B&H. Thank you, all the people who came here today. I appreciate it. And I'll see you. Uh, welcome to follow me on Instagram. And I'll see you here next time. Thank you.